Germany, the seventh largest country in Europe, with the largest population in the European Union and the largest number of neighbors on the continent. With a population of 83 million people, the country is a federation of 16 states called Lands, which are powerful actors on the German political scene. German post-war politics has been dominated by the Christian Democratic Union and the Social Democratic Party, a grand coalition. Every chancellor so far has been a member of one of these two parties. But change is afoot in the German political landscape. The far-right populist alternative for Germany is gaining support and has won enough votes to secure seats in the Bundestag for the first time since the Second World War. It has set off alarm bells in the German media. This is a worrying sign and another defeat for Chancellor Olaf Scholz, one headline reads. How will the emergence of openly pro-Russian and anti-Ukrainian parties shift the political scene? That remains to be seen for Germany, one of the leading forces of European integration, an engine of EU economy and an icon of quality and reliability. How much of it still stands in 2024? Can Europe rely on German commitment to the whole community? Will economic hurdles reshuffle German politics and put it on an isolationist course? In this program we are going to ask questions that matter to the future of Europe. We ask capital questions in capital cities and starting from here, from Berlin. Here in the Humboldt University, the oldest university in the city, scientists and thinkers of the highest caliber have considered the nature of the world. Albert Einstein, Max Weber, Arthur Schopenhauer, and many more. Ideas born in great minds have had enormous power to change the world, for good and for worse. The ideas of peace and prosperity gave us the European Union. Today, the EU is a ship that's being tossed on the seas of global instability. What is the future of the European project as seen from here? West Germany's approach to dispelling the demons of World War II created a blueprint for a common European community. Hand in hand with its eternal enemy France, West Germany set the tone and pace for an integrating Europe. For the sake of the community, they even gave up their own currency and replaced the Deutsche Mark with the Euro. After the fall of the Berlin War, a reunited Germany also became an advocate for the enlargement of the Union to include the former Eastern Bloc countries. In 2015, it was Germany that opened the border to one million refugees from Syria and North Africa. But for several years now, the Franco-German engine has been stalled. Today's Germany is experiencing economic stagnation. According to current forecasts, it's still expected to see a GDP growth of negative 0.1% this year. The public is tired of migrants and refugees, and the social unrest has only grown in the wake of the terrorist attack in Solingen. Populist forces are exploiting these sentiments for political gain, and successfully so. We saw it in the last month's state elections in the country's east. The AFD won nearly 30% of the vote, and in some places even more, in all three elections. The largest opposition force, the CDU, is now stepping up its rhetoric on migrants. The coalition government is responding to these developments by imposing controls at all its borders. 73% of Germans support the move, even as neighboring countries find it hard to accept. What does this mean for the Schengen zone, one of the pillars of European unity? Can an inward-looking Germany still drive European integration? And joining me in Capital Questions today, Stephen Bastus, political scientist and historian, Gens Hagen Foundation, welcome to the program. Uh, Isabel Hoffmann, founder of EU Opinions, an independent platform for European public opinion, but also a former editor at Die Zeit, a journalist. Uh, Christian Johann, expert on European integration and director of European Academy Berlin, welcome. And finally, Bernhard Huttermann, the European Movement of Germany, the largest German civil society network for Europe. And a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for our guests. 
We're delighted that you've uh, managed to join us today. And let's start with uh, what, what we've talked about in, in, in this film a second ago. Many countries of the region look at Berlin, look at Germany, uh, to see what's, what's next for Europe in political terms, but also in, 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 in social terms. And in many cases, they are worried about uh, what they see. Are you worried, or should they be worried, about what they see? Isabel, perhaps? I see you nodding. It is a very some situation, right? It is a very some situation for the EU as a whole, uh, and also for the world. And I think there are many political fields in which we don't really know what's next. Mm -hmm. And this has been the situation for quite some years now. And I, I think we do see the pressure also on the public, and we do see a certain translation into the political sphere. Uh, and so uh, it depends a little bit. It's a little bit of a character test, mm. you know, how you actually respond to this question. But there are things that, but there are things that in Germany uh, people are not used to, for, for at least for a long time. That is uh, some kind of economic stagnation. Is that correct? To, to have it uh, minus 0.1. I'm sorry, you, you disagree with that? Yeah, we're going to have. We already had this discussion okay. with the sick man of Europe. Mm. I remember the yeah. economist saying that yeah. that Germany is the sick man of Europe. Mm. Who went out of this? So I think I'm, I'm more from this uh, side saying uh, we should have more optimism about possibilities right. and not angstful, okay. German, is, German word angst, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that we shouldn't be too, too worried about things. But of course, I agree with Isabel that um, the, the, the uncertainty is so big in many respects, uh, but also the, the feeling in Germany that for a long, long time we, mm -hmm. we arranged with the with the things with our neighbors, and um, finally we, we are back to reality in sure. many respects. Reality check. Yep. Stephen, reasons for worrying? I mean, you not? can always worry, and there are a lot of reasons for it. I mean, uh, I think we have to get one step back just to uh, know what we are talking about. You just uh, mentioned the history of, of the European integration project. And the central part of, of Germany that uh, played a historical role in, in building up this uh, yeah, yeah. huge, huge Great. project. But of course, I mean, we are in a new reality right now. It's a complete new kind of game that we are entering. And it's quite obvious that there are a lot of uncertainties all around. And everybody is looking around who could help us. And uh, of course, every, everybody was well, used if, to if, look if, at Germany. If you were to judge, if you were to judge, Stephen, then which uncertainty would you judge as the most dangerous, potentially? Uh, well, I mean, we are uh, having, having war back in, in Europe, just a, co a couple of kilometers away from here. And one of the worrying facts, of course, is that you don't actually feel it here in Berlin. I mean, there are a lot of political debates going on, a lot of uh, more or less cheap talk as well. Uh, also, of course, I mean, a very uh, hard support for Ukraine, sanctions on Russia and so yeah. forth. But there's no imminent sense of danger. And um, I would absolutely agree with... And that's with, a danger in itself. Uh, absolutely. I mean, if you, if you want to be... Uh, if you want to face a new reality, you have to face the, uh, the, the, the dangers of it. Mm. But if you face it, then you can have the, the chance to be relaxed. Because uh, in times of danger, in times of uncertainties and change, uh, the uh, most prominent uh, mistake that you can make is to panic. Right. So, uh, keep on, uh, have a tea. Keep on. Exactly. All right. Uh, Christian. Some of the foundations, I think, of what we thought we were are shattered. Shattered by the pandemic, shattered by the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine, shattered by a downward spiral. When we look around at our infrastructure, yeah. we see everything as a sign of a downward spiral, and we are in the middle of this, going back again to be some sick man uh, in Europe. We had this before, yeah. late 90s. And we are, it seems like everything we see, every change we see, yeah. seems to be a sign of the times that it is in it, some way. It, we don't have any That plus, hold. I'm asking this question also because I heard President Macron when he was here in Berlin uh, just a few days ago, he said, Europe might actually die. That's what he said. He also said that uh, NATO is uh, mm. brain death. Brain death. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, this, is, this is political spotting. Yeah? They try mm. to put the, the issues to the, to the media and, and, and to get attention in a mm. certain way. But this keep carry on is something I think we really need now. And we saw the Berlin Wall f fell down, 89, mm. and everything what happened afterwards. All right. don't, for don't forget okay. Germany was, were two countries. And to, to make it possible that this country is uh, united mm. is not easy. We saw the, the downsides, of course. Um, 
But um, yeah, it's, uh, Eastern Germany is one of the wealthiest regions in Europe. Full and stop. It took time. It took time to digest this, and I think we are in the middle of a situation in which we try to digest a new setting in Europe. Something we didn't see. We may, may have been mm. too blind to accept what partners and neighbors told us before. But I think this is a process of digestion right now. Right, that so has let, to be let, stuff. Let's get to a bit more details. Do you keep calm and carry on when it comes to? rising populism and, and far-right extremism in politics in Germany? We've seen it in, in the recent elections. I definitely don't. I mean, mm. it's, it's, it's clear that in every society are a lot of authoritarians. I'm not talking so much about populism, because right. populism, everybody does. Mm. Yeah? But it's more dangerous when authoritarian uh, movements, uh, nationalistic movements, um, are trying to do that. And the strategic corruption by Russia. They are feeding with money, with, uh, with misinformation, with fake news, feeding our societies, our media. And, and that, is, that is the most more dangerous part. And the, let me also say another thing. Um, I'm more afraid of the, of the center following this kind of narrative. All right, so, so, you're, not afra me... so you're not afraid uh, of what we've seen in the last uh, local elections, the rise of AFD, the rise of uh, extremist parties? To be honest, mm -hmm. I think it is showing a situation in East Germany, in former communist parts of mm -hmm. the country, where people were not felt treat, treated well mm -hmm. enough. And I think it's kind of, it, it was kind of expectable. Sure. Um, and um, what makes me more worried is the other side. Uh, saying we want to close the borders, they don't close the borders, but they make this border populism, saying mm. we do something. I just had a meeting with the, uh, an ambassador of a Western neighboring country, and, and she said that it's amazing um, how, how, how fake news also the German government is doing, okay. in a way. So that, that, that worries me a lot. Thanks, Stephen. I mean, uh, everybody is worried about the rise of uh, right-wing extremism, populism, mm. uh, and anti-Europeanism in, in, mm. in Germany. That, that's for sure. Dexit. Dexit. I mean, but there's no serious debate on, about Dexit, so mm. we shouldn't start a debate right here. But I think the uh, the rise of the of the extremes uh, they just reflect a kind of weakness of the center, mm. and uh, uh, the center parties or obviously not able to meet expectations of the people, but even more, I mean, you mentioned the uh, big thinkers of Berlin, Schopenhauer and Einstein and so forth. I mean, Schopenhauer wrote a book about the world as will and, and imagination. And part of the weakness of the center is that there is ever less will and mm. imagination. Right. So if you look, uh, ask about uh, what is the future of the European integration, what does uh, Germany think, there are no big ideas for Europe right mm. now. And this is definitely a kind of intellectual of vacuum uh, where we don't have to wonder that the, uh, we are facing a kind of upper, uphill struggle against... Uh, where should we look for these ideas for Europe now in 2024? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot. We, we should, first of all, avoid this circle, vicious circle of pessimism. Mm. Because there's a lot of things that we can pr be proud of, especially, I mean, you, you mentioned the German-German reunification process, which we just celebrated. Uh, there's a kind of uh, defeatist, kind of uh, pessimistic uh, approach to all okay. this. But there's a lot uh, that we achieved. Right. And there's a lot of potential to make sure that Europe will be a success in the future. Okay. I don't want to dwell into this pessimism. I will not. But there's just another point of concern coming from uh, other countries of Europe. And this time from a European expert in Zagreb in Croatia, Ivan Novoselic from the Academy of Political Development. I would really like to know how you see the uh, current uh, border controls being introduced, reintroduced into within the Schengen uh, area. Um, Germany has recently introduced the restrictions and everybody is obviously looking at Germany as an example and we can see other countries as well uh, doing the same thing. So. Are you afraid that this is the beginning of the end of uh, Schengen? And how do you see this uh, situation developing? Will there be a domino effect? Or is there hope that uh, our most precious European Union value of freedom of movement of people uh, remains? Is this realistic that, that it will start 
the demise of uh, Schengen zone. Well, there is reason to be afraid, especially when you look at the situation we had this year in Germany, mm. where we had almost 1.5 million people going to the streets mm. against extremism for democracy, and then the reaction and the tool that the government is taking out of the toolbox is more control at the borders. Nobody was going to the streets for more control on the borders. Mm. So this is, this is something that we should be afraid of, that the tools and the, the mechanisms and the reactions are something that is not in alignment with what the people asked for. Isabel. Yeah, well, on the other hand, I mean, I think it's probably the art, right, to find, I mean, as I said, there are many reasons to be worried. Mm. And Schengen zone is one of them or not? The goal is to turn that into, into action, right, mm. and not to kind of retrieve and to shut down. So, I do agree with everything that has been said, however, I mean, uh, lack of border control mm. <laughs> um, combined with migration makes uh, trouble for governments uh, everywhere in the world right now, okay. right? So this it's is, a global this is phenomenon the political I, cost that the German government is ready to pay in order to keep the political stability in the country, right? All I'm saying, I'm, I'm not making a judgment call whether this is the right thing or the wrong thing. Well, I'd like, to, to, ask say, you to, I'd like to ask you to actually make a judgment. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. <laughs> and I'm trying to give an answer. I think, um, uh, I feel very attached to the freedom of movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and I uh, don't think it'll fall or this will be the end of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I do see the very that, you know, Germany as the biggest country is uh, looked at uh, with a great uh, sense of, you know, it's very important what they're doing and what they're not doing. However, we also have a rise of the AfD. And I think uh, we can say this is also a global phenomenon, which, right. is re which is really bad, you know. But we also... Do you we, think it will stop also, the rise of the we also, we, Well, who has had the recipe mm. so far? Mm. I mean, I think if one country would have had it, we would know it by now. Okay. <laughs> but also, we don't have, we have, I mean, in this city, mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, there's a different layer to it. <laughs> okay, now, just, just be refer okay, yeah? You, you want judgment. Now, yeah. I can tell you, frankly, that this is the wrong way. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, just following the recipes of the far right mm -hmm. will not lead to the uh, political, I mean, that we win this, this mm -hmm. kind of battle about, uh, not about only the fate of, of, of Europe, but the fate of Germany. So this is a kind of dangerous road that we are... And it's uh, a mistake, uh, is it? Sorry? It's a mistake. It's a mistake. It's a clear-cut mistake. But it will definitely not be the end of Schengen. Schengen is too big to fail. It's too important to fail. But of course, it reflects, once again, a kind of ignorance uh, behind it that Germany actually doesn't care too much. And there's no big debate about how is this perceived in Croatia, for instance, in Poland, in Central and Eastern Europe, but also in the, in the border, in border uh, lands of uh, Germany and France and so forth. I mean, these are kind of integrated borderlands and these kind of uh, border checks, uh, they, uh, they establish a major hurdle for, for the people on both sides of the border. 30% of the population of the European Union are in border regions. Mm. And sometimes I forget about that, you'd say, capital questions. Berlin is a capital which is very far away from a borderline, and you feel it. Mm. The government is acting like that. They're just looking at t t to kind of spinning um, to say we need to act on something. But, but if you on, go it's to 40, the it's 74 percent people actually supporting this decision, isn't it? The, the, the point is that, that if you ever create a kind of narrative also in media, and this is what the spin doctors are doing, mm. they're trying to solve this now, and then they want to keep it out of the general election next year. Mm. That is the idea behind it. When you go to the border control, either, you, either they are right and they make controls, but they're not doing it, this is populism, or they're doing it, it is, would be completely wrong because it would destroy Schengen. Thanks God, it's the first lie, but it's still not honest. And um, I completely agree, this government had a very good coalition treaty on, on European affairs, on making the European Union stronger, all failed. There was, they can say it's because of the others, because of Ukraine, it's because of uh, the Russian attack before. They can say that, but the responsibility in a certain way is very awkward in Germany, because on the one hand side, everybody wants Germany to act, but when Germany is acting, people don't like because it's dominating. So that is always the old question. Um, I'm happy that 
the Do other you remember the words of uh, former uh, po Polish uh, Foreign Minister Radek Sikorski, who said, I fear German power less than German inaction. Yeah, but many years ago in different contexts. But, but everybody grew up with this idea, I want to have many Germanys because mm. I like it so much. <laughs> that was another, another idea before. So the German population grew up with this kind of uh, no, difficult but, all right. situation. Is there a feeling in Germany, among politicians, but also among people, that uh, Germany, and France perhaps, but Germany wants to be really a driving, co driving force, leader of the European Union today or not? I don't see it. I would, I would connect it. I would love to see an idea or, no. or, or a vision for, uh, for Europe, but I don't see it right now that anybody is formulating this, this vision or idea for either really for the government. Germany I would like leading? to see a discussion about where do we want to go. Yeah. And to, in order to have a discussion, you would have to have one person or one mm. party or whatever to, 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 to paint, an, paint an image. Olaf Scholz last year in 2022 actually said, we need a geopolitical EU and enlarged, uh, enlarged and reformed EU. That, that sounds a bit like a vision, doesn't it? Well, what, what followed? I mean, uh, he gave some, some nice speeches in Prague and in Strasbourg and so forth, but this was not European leadership. Mm. So, so it's just political talk. That is pretty much uh, political talk. And uh, a chancellor is not mm. just uh, paid for giving visions or kind of uh, pathway to the future, but also to deliver. And he and this government definitely did not deliver and has not delivered mm. on, uh, on the European issue. And this is a major failure. And that is uh, really a kind of tragedy because actually we, they started out as the most pro-European, most ambitious uh, German government government for Europe, but actually... So what happened? So Europe somehow disappeared mm. uh, on, on the way. I mean, we, we have a lot of problems here and there, and it's not just because, and it's not the, just about ideas and delivering kind of visions, it's really about leading Europe uh, through these uh, incredible uh, times of insecurity and uh, leading a war. I mean, this is... Which Germany we will talk about in a moment, yeah. yes, the war, is Isabel. It is Europe disappearing from German public opinion and sort of a willingness, ability to lead or to, to be a driving force? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, this has, he has been accused of not leading in Germany as well huh? and for Germany as well. And I think it's, uh, it's a claim, it's uh, a claim that former Chancellor Merkel mm. had to deal with herself. You know, it's, I mean, the issue of, 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 of German leaders and leadership uh, as Bernd alluded to, is a, is a difficult one, also on the European stage. Um, uh, it is better to be claimed for than actually to be seen <laughs> in most of the time. So I, I, I guess the approach that would be preferable is, is sort of leading from behind, okay. right? <laughs> so uh, also enable, make sure that, you know, everybody's taking along, uh, because there is very easily the claim, and, and rightly so, huh? the claim of maybe dominance, uh, because there are so many also very small countries. Uh, may on may the I side. say something yes. positive? Is, Please do, um, yes. Because I, 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 we have to acknowledge that this government had to make a shift in, in the way of dealing with Poland, for example, and especially in the Ukrainian case. And, 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 and there's still a lot, large uh, number of people in Germany who are really Russian friendly. Okay. To, let's face it. So, so to have a to have a shift in this politics um, is is a really big step, and they managed fairly well. I was not expecting it. On the other hand side, the the, the basic things, what to do with the current European Union, um, was put into the background. Right. And, and what we see... Um, w will is it come back from the background? Yeah. No, and no, the problem is, uh, since the Brexit for everybody was clear, there will be no Dexit discussion. Mm. The same as in Austria, in other country. Brexit is the clear point that people want the European Union functioning. But there's still the old way, fashioned way of, of, of dealing with things, and that's why the, the vision is lacking to, to deal with this from a German perspective. All right. Enlargement new members of the European Union from the German perspective, yes or no? There's a list of candidates. Absolutely. And it's one of the key issues and uh, we have to deliver on it, but it will be very, very hard. And uh, the, uh, the reality check, how strong is the German de uh, determination on the enlargement issue, mm is still open. I mean, it's, uh, that is an open question because it's a very long path. Mm. 
But this will be one of the really yardsticks for, for judging on, on uh, Germany's future European course, that's for sure. I think there's an opportunity that has been missed. Uh, I look at a lot of uh, data from public opinion, and for the longest time, enlargement was just a non-issue, you know, and we're eventually asking people about it, never got much of a response. Um, uh, the war hits the continent, so Russia mm. uh, uh, invades a Ukraine. Immediately it shifts, you know, it rises up on the attention span and people say, yes, we need this. But if you have an, op an opportunity like that, you really do need to underline and to work it, mm. <laughs> right, from the, from, the, from the political side. And this is where I would say there is a lack of leadership coming in, because then you need to give it a reason. You need to give it a story. You know, you, give it a, you need to give it an urgency. And I think this is not actually what happened. And it's a weakness in German politics, not only with this government, but with the series of governments now. Right. And I think that is really an issue, because you have a, ha you have a difficulty to bring actually the people along in sure. these very difficult decisions. Can I decisions. just ask you, because I know that you're dealing with public opinion very much, you know all about it in Germany. Can I just ask you about the young people, the youngest electorate or the, the uh, youngest voters? Where are they on all these threats? And in particular, I'm asking about this uh, extremism in, 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 in politics, because it seems they kind of like it. So I'm just trying to think what's going to happen when they, as they grow older, are they going to abandon these, uh, these sentiments or quite the opposite? Well, for the longest time we have seen that uh, younger age groups, let's call it, uh, were just more positive, more optimistic mm -hmm. and more enthusiastic also when it came to, to the EU and European issues, more open, let's say. it. And it seems like there's a shift happening. But what we also see is that this uh, discrepancy kind of slows down a little, you know, as they, as they get older. So it wouldn't take, you know, what an 18-year-old says mm. today and then make a shift and say, okay, this is what he's going to say, she's going to say at 38, 48, you know, etc. So, uh, but there's a new element coming in, and Bert Bern talked about it, and that's social media. You know, the way it is used to influence, you know, TikTok, nobody really knows how the algorithm works. We were complaining about the algorithms with other social media platforms. This, this is the one uh, kids are very uh, close-knit to, and we do not know, really know how it works. Uh, and it seems to create mischief right. and difficulties in quite a lot of countries, and apparently in this one too. Okay. Well, today the shape of the European Union's future is not only decided here in Berlin or in Paris or in Brussels or in Warsaw for that matter, it's also being forged as we speak just beyond the EU's borders. And Kiev, the success of the European project depends on how we react to Putin's imperialist ambitions. Few expected the full-scale Russian aggression against Ukraine in 2022, and even fewer believed Ukraine could fend off the attack. But when it happened, heavy criticism fell on Germany for its long years of economic support for Russia. Projects like Nord Stream 1 and 2 became symbols of Berlin's failed politics and naivety. The reality check was blunt. When cheap Russian gas supplies dried up, the economy and the people had to pay the price. Energy bills skyrocketed. According to polls conducted in 2022 by the Polish Institute of Public Affairs, Putin's attack on Ukraine was also a turning point for the German public. 74% of respondents said they perceived Russia as a threat to Germany. Authorities responded by promising to create a 100 billion euro military fund Olaf Scholz also announced military aid to the struggling Ukraine, though in a rather cautious way. Germany has taken in hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian refugees. Slowly but surely, German arms supplies are making their way to the Ukrainian front. However, after more than two years of war, the sense of threat from Russia is waning. It stands at 60% today. Public support for arms supplies has also fallen from 58% in 2022 to 49% today. More and more people are tired of the war and it's become a convenient political platform for populists. We will stay with Ukraine as long as it takes, says Chancellor Scholz. But how long is as long as it takes? How long can Berlin stick to its guns as it faces mounting social and political pressure? All right, the question's already been asked, so how long is it, as long as it takes? 
It will be very long, mm. for quite long. I mean, there's a lot of talk about peace talks, about ceasefire in Berlin, but this is, reflects the internal debate, our domestic debate, not the realities in Ukraine, and not the realities uh, uh, concerning the European uh, security architecture. So I think uh, we should be frank also to, to in the, how we communicate it to, to the public, that this is uh, a war that will drag on for quite some time. And even if it stops, uh, this will be it not will the be end. A it war. is just a frozen uh, kind and of just break. Just preparation for the next. So stage. we, uh, this is uh, this is the uh, kind of new reality that we have to to face and you have to adapt to. And this will not disappear. It is a new situation. This confrontation with Russia is here to stay. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Be before we go on and, and, and dwell on this issue of war Ukraine, here's a question, an opening question uh, from Kiev. Let's listen to it. How does Germany understand the victory of Ukraine? Does it mean a military defeat of Russia and return of all occupied Ukrainian territories and uh, provision of security guarantees to Ukraine, including NATO membership? Yes, how, how Germany understands the victory, because it's, it's not very clear anywhere, really. What does it mean for, for, for Ukraine to actually uh, have a victory? To have a victory would mean that there's a united Ukraine in the borders of before 2014. With Crimea? Yes, with Crimea. Is it realistic? That's the next question, but mm. there's a question in between these two questions, and this is the question in how far should we not listen to the Ukrainians, what they think is uh, their victory. So it's very, and we are moving towards a situation in which we answer this question here in Germany, and in which we are trying to find a position without talking to the Ukrainians as much as we used to do in the beginning, I think. Or well, this is one of the fears I would see, that we are playing the global game, um, talking about peace conferences with Putin and somebody else, and then to decide what means victory or what means peace for, for Ukraine. It's a very slippery slope once you uh, take it for Germany. Don't. This is not my answer, but I think many people in Germany would think it would be enough a victory if Putin get, would get tired to be imperialistic. Mm. To stop. <laughs> uh, it's not my, my answer to the whole thing, but I think this is the, 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 the sentiment from people from East Germany, um, which have a lot of sentiment for, for Russia still, but also in West Germany, many, many left-wing uh, groups, uh, they never understood that the wall was, uh, was bad, yeah? so that was how, how I grew up. Uh, many times I even had teachers in West Germany thinking that, uh, that the uprise in East Germany wasn't ever happening before in the 17th of, of, of June. So there, there are many, many things, untold stories, and now we're getting to this point, and it makes it people very, very uh, uncomfortable to, to give the right answer. So that's, that would be my, my compromise answer for, for, for the general compromise ideas. Answer. A few days ago, Chancellor Scholz said, I believe now it's time to discuss how to get out of this war. Everybody should think about <laughs> well, it. <laughs> well, yeah, but the way, going out of this war might mean really different things. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there is obviously one answer that was the official answer, and I think it still is, is, you know, victory is defined by Ukrainians. You know, I mean, I don't, if, if you want to use the word victory, you know, I mean, th there are so many traps <laughs> in, this, <laughs> in this question. I don't mm. even know where to start. Mm. So, so let's say, because also you're asking us to make a judgment from our vantage point. However, none of us know how it is to be in the country, to live through it, on the every day, you know, and if they decide for themselves, it's, you know, it's enough, we need to get out. I think that's the paramount mm. thing. On the other hand, it's probably, it probably, we probably shouldn't be in a situation in which it is forbidden <laughs> for actors, um, for other actors thinking about it, uh, about solutions. Yeah. But it, what's... I think in a way dangerous is that the, the support for Ukraine, basically people are tired of, of the is. war. That's a natural process. Uh, but I think it, it's quite dangerous for, for Ukrainians, obviously. We don't know what's going to happen uh, in, in, in the United States after the elections, but... I don't really yeah. see but how you is... get tired of being in a war you're not in. So 
It's just getting tired of hearing of a war. This is yeah, but that's a fact. But it's happening. That's a fact. It's happening. <laughs> it's that's happening. the point. It's happening. I can show you the but data. It, and it's happening rapidly. Yeah, but uh, for, for six months mon- now, people, people know, kept it up for mm. two years. And this is also not a, it's not a phenomenon in Germany uh, alone. Yes, it's yes. happening all over Europe. It's even happening in the world. We have, I have U.S. data on hand, and you see it. And I think it's no, it's also no good to 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 say that's not happening. Um, no, but you have to address. It's difficult. <laughs> yeah, it's you, very you, difficult. You definitely have to address it. You can just can't just uh, accept it. We have these kind of trends, and we have to to address it in a way that uh, we have to uh, open the eyes of the public what we are actually talking about. I mean, we all tired. We always tired. Life is tiring, but uh, uh, being tired is not an option. Uh, it's not a strategy at all. I mean, uh, we have to uh, face and communicate the the consequences. So if we we give up Ukraine, if Ukraine doesn't survive, this is a key uh, kind of uh, answer to your first question, what does victory mean? Ukraine has to prevail, and Ukraine will prevail. Uh, I'm not sure about this autocratic, corrupt system in, in Russia, this kind of slavery house. I'm not sure that they will prevail this war, but Ukraine has to prevail. Sure, but those people that, that, that are tired, yeah. and, and Isabel has just said that there are many, many there are more and more people being tired of it. Don't they understand it? Yeah, but then let's uh, be frank. I mean, what does it mean? We, we give up on Ukraine, uh, then we have a huge Russian uh, empire right mm. next door. I mean, not just right next door to Poland, but right yeah. next door to Europe and just 100 kilometers, I mean, a couple of kilometers away from here. Uh, so, and this will entail much more costs than supporting Ukraine right, okay. now. So, Christian. this is the key, the key message. There, okay. there is no option B. I mean, the option B is much more costly and it will be much more tiring all right. for all of us here sure. and also in Germany. And my question is, do people understand it or not? Do well, politicians explain it to them? And, 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 and this is also p- one of the tasks that politicians have to take up. Yeah, but to well, explain they're failing again, it at the, again at play the, uh, the positive game here. I mean, we had the European election and we have a European Commission now in place. Uh, we might say there are too many uh, right-wing and some left-wing uh, 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 parties winning also in European elections, but overall it's a very stable majority in the center. And it's, very, it's for freedom, for democracy, mm-hmm. and it's against Russia. Mm-hmm. So it was never before like this. We're coming from a wrong way in Germany. You, you mentioned this North Stream. German governments made so many mistakes and not listening to Poland. Mm. To wrong government, I, I think, but it was still the right arguments. And it didn't help the, the, the opposition in those days in Poland. Uh, with the they didn't listen, has, listen to the Scandinavian countries, they didn't listen to the Baltic countries. Mm-hmm. So Germany has to listen up to smaller countries in a common sense, and it's a community method we need. Do you listen so not now? Just this big country game. Do, do, you listen, do you listen now in Germany uh, to all those voices? Yeah. I mean, talking about uh, politicians and then general public I, opinion. I mean, we, we are talking about a coalition which is uh, starting well, we ha- which wants to listen mm-hmm. to many, many, uh, many countries, but, um, for example, France is, is, is getting difficulties mm-hmm. in these days. Poland is positive. Mm-hmm. Scandinavian countries are getting positive. By the way, also right-wing are losing there. So it's not always this, this, this game. We shouldn't play into the strap of this game, everything goes wrong. People were profiting from cheap gas in Russia in their pockets, poor people, rich people, companies, everybody. We have to get used to it. And the other thing is, um, we have to understand that Eastern Europe is not just Russia. And, and for mon- many decades, it was in Germany a big mistake. That I hope we understand. Yeah, but, everybody yeah. understands. <laughs> I mean, that I hope everybody <laughs> understands. I mean, but, but don't do this mistake of talking just about Poland, France, uh, and, 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 and Russia. That doesn't work either. We have mm. Benelux, we have Scandinavian countries, we have success stories in the Baltic states, mm. former Soviet Union, success. Mm. And when we're talking about the enlargement process, yes, there's economic success, sure. the stability of success, and it is protecting our freedom, because obviously. if we wouldn't have made the enlargement, and Russia would be closer to Berlin. And lot, obviously, and lots of warning uh, coming from uh, the uh, Baltic states, obviously, Don't about mention, Russia. Yeah. They do know it from experience. Yeah. Uh, Christian, you wanted to say something? I wanted to say that the reaction was very clear in the beginning, citing when the, the, the money Perfect. they put into the, yes. into the army, so the reaction was, was great, and was very European in the beginning. And, but it is beginning to grind down. There's a constant grind. This is what we, when we talk about, are we tired of the war? But it's not to be tired. It's more about an external grind that is working all the time 
working at the cohesion of our societies, working mm. in the minds of, of young, not just young people, by the way, but also old people who are using uh, social media. And we have to be aware and to educate people that All right. this, is, this is a strategy, that is a constant sure. way to, to, to with, work with, at us. Sure. With, with all the mistakes that you've mentioned already, Bernd, in, in a second ago, what should Germany do now when it comes to uh, Ukraine and war in, in Ukraine? In general terms, in terms of military aid, in terms of, uh, I don't know, public opinion, education, and so on and so forth. What should be the main focus on Ukraine here in Berlin or from Berlin? Uh, we have a money issue here in Germany. It's not, it's not a poor country. We have a constitution which is enshrining uh, uh, inflexibility in, when it comes to budget. Mm. So we don't, don't uh, want to use the money uh, for the right purposes. Okay. But, there is but this the, was an excuse, the, now the, the answer please. The, but yes. the, the, the good news is there is the money, mm. the key we didn't find yet. So if there's a governmental change, you can make a change. And if things get worse, America gets, gets the wrong president, p things get even worse in, in Ukraine, there is a possibility that Germany so can even more financing to, uh, to the, the, Ukrainian, the Ukrainians, basically, more money for the Ukrainians, more military aid to the, Uk yes. to the Ukrainians. But also be stronger as the, as the, secu you know, the security right. level, okay. security union in the European Union. We are not spending few money, we're spending wrong money okay, okay. in Europe. But you and, just and blocked it when, Pol when you? Poland comes back so into this game off. and saying, let's, let's do it with Berlin, uh, and Brussels and other countries to, to, to build up a Euro real U defense union mm. and a foreign, foreign policy, which is, has really uh, worth its name. And okay. Poland, if you Poland wants to have a, an enlargement, they have to also go for, for a, man, a majority voting in the council. Yes. Okay, just a sentence. Mm. Yeah, uh, to give you a concrete uh, answer, it's not just about money economics. I mean, we are talking about war, so we have to make sure that Ukraine is strong enough uh, to be successful on the battlefield. And this entails one of the key proposals of the Ukrainian side is uh, to get the permission to strike uh, into, into, Russia. Russia, into Russian territories, where actually the rockets come from. Mm. And this is uh, right now key militarily. I mean, uh, and we would be uh, very wisely uh, advised uh, to talk about this with the Americans and to have a common stance exactly this. So this is a kind of uh, key issue right now which Ukraine needs and we should deliver. Right, okay. That's, now the war is on, but let's very briefly talk about what's after the war. And we've got a question this time from Prague, from, from Czechia, from the Czech Republic. Uh, there were thousands of, of German companies uh, in Ukraine before the war. So my question is whether you expect that uh, Germany will keep uh, this position also after the war being a key provider of foreign direct investment for Ukraine economy. And uh, also whether you would regard uh, Ukraine as a kind of solution uh, for uh, decoupling of German companies from the Russian market. And that was Martin Swarovski. A former diplomat from, from Prague asking this question about what, what after the war, especially when it comes to... I'm, I'm very positive on this because uh, um, Germany was a country in, in the war and after the war this Wirtschaftswunder in Germany came up and, and because uh, it could manage to, 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 to build up on these, these uh, exp awful experiences uh, to, 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 to concentrate in a good economy. And, and the enlargement process, especially for Germany, we have small and medium-sized enterprises as the backbone of our economy in Germany. It's not the big enterprises, not just mm. Volkswagen or whatever, which might have problems now. It's the small and medium-sized enterprises, and those are very flexible, like in Poland, they're very flexible to go into the countries. And Germany was profiting at large from the enlargement process. This is what people don't know, this is what the public opinion doesn't know, especially Berlin doesn't know the, mm. the, this bubble here. Um, it is something what uh, will bring Germany in a, in a forehand uh, uh, after, after a victory in, in Ukraine, for sure. And unfortunately this story is not yet told because that makes people even more afraid because they think about cheap money from, from, from Russia, cheap, cheap uh, gas and, and, and oil, um, but that's not a sustainable solution for us. It's, it's this, this small and medium-sized enterprises which I bring up. Right. Uh, but by the way, is it, in your opinion, is it too early to talk about how to treat Russia after the war? Uh, how, to, how to deal with it? Is it premature a no, question at no, this? No, it's not premature. What it's should we do with Russia after the war? How to, uh, how to keep it accountable what, what, what Russia has done? 
I think when it comes to the point of time when we have to think about it, we are way beyond thinking about it because when we all talk about freedom now, and this is one of the political mm. buzzwords, freedom to call, ask for freedom, but nobody knows how to organize it. If you want to organize freedom, you always have to organize it with your enemy. Mm. And Russia is the enemy right now, so we have to talk, constantly talk and think about how to organize freedom with a player on a global scale that is not looking for freedom how? or for, for, for peace. It how? shouldn't be Versailles. How? It shouldn't Absolutely. be no, Versailles. No, it cannot be. And no Yalta. <laughs> So actually, I mean, uh, if we talk about Russia, as long as Russia stays like it is, and there's no dramatic kind of uh, change, uh, which is possible, but not very likely, we have to figure out a very smart, modern uh, kind of version of containment. And this will go beyond the war, of yeah, course. Going back to history, in a way. Going back to history, we will uh, study George Kennan and uh, these, these guys. This is a completely different kind of setting now. Where it's a different world. But we need a kind of long-term kind of security strategy towards uh, Russia, which means we have to con contain Russia. Is this possible? This the world is, is possible, so, of course. The world I mean, is how, so what? different from what it used to be when, true, when the containment but, policy was I mean, being uh, applied. Just, well, we, we have war now for more than two, two and a half years around. So nobody th uh, thought in the beginning that it would be possible to get rid of uh, uh, Russian gas and oil. Mm. But we somehow managed, we, we are still not perfect in this. Uh, I mean, this is a kind of a different kind of story, but we managed to, uh, to change a lot. And this is the first kind of step towards a long-term containment strategy towards Russia. And it is possible. Right. And it will be possible. It's not just about Russia. It's also about China and a changing kind of world order, where it's not just this, um, this perception that we had that it's uh, the end of history and it's all a free market and we're yeah. all happy to, to earn money and doing business. Now we are entering a new reality once again. And the Polish Prime Minister not so long ago said, uh, talking about Western Europe, not about Ukraine or Russia, he said, we live in pre-war times. Was that a, an exaggerate, a pessimistic, I'm sorry about that word, we sort of slide into pessimism from time to time here, or most of the time really. Uh, so <laughs> is, was that in, an exaggeration in, in your opinion, or is that a... Um this was an appeal to our historical memory. Mm. And the big difference, uh, uh, if you compare Germany and Europe now with the German Europe in pre-war times, 100 years ago, is that we do have this experience. We just have, we tend to re forget about it. So I, this kind of uh, advice uh, from the Polish uh, prime ministers is highly welcome, just to remind us what is at stake mm. and to draw the right conclusions. And then we will do it. Scaremongering, in your opinion? I don't know, I tried to say earlier, I think that, you know, fear can be something good if it activates you, you know, you get into action and you, you know, you get into the fight. No, you would judge and I think, the and I think, yeah, I think, you know, we're ready for a fight. I hope it's, I, we're probably already in the middle of the fight, you know, we kind of fight different direction toward, you know, an uncertainty of the future, you know, there are lots of transition. Uh, process is going on and we see it in data people tend to react very differently towards it right and you have a 50 50 kind of chance of falling on the one hand on the one side or the other side some people are just afraid of the new thing that's coming you cannot say tell them well don't you right. worry you know because it's also a little bit that's yeah. what I said if I may yeah. a character game <laughs> All right. <laughs> right? Okay. is it how you how you react to that and I think you know um, if we're in that fight and it's a good fight uh, and we keep up the energy and then the leadership comes in, All right. you know, you can actually get to the better point. M may I become yes, now negative? Almost running out of time, Bernd, yes. Yeah, may, may I become a little bit negative now? Uh, because yeah. uh, For a change. For a change. Uh, I see uh, in the state elections, uh, Wagenknecht, AFD, they, they are people giving up. They are afraid of the Russian bear. Mm. They are afraid of, they are like this. They are the stronger ones. We have to give in. This is, this is the narrative which is going on. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there I'm afraid a bit. Um, I, I'm really thinking that, um, that if we, if we put, put it in this way, um, then, then we might lose it. Um, but coming back again, I was born 1970 in the West Germany. And, and I mean, what were, were people afraid? What could they see? What was possible? That, then I come back to this positive part. Berlin Wall came down. Um, it is something, what, what the change was ama amazing, and this is also what was said before, people are tired of change.
mm. in every country, especially in former communist countries. But even it's, more change is coming, obviously. Uh, yeah, and, and then this, they, they are afraid, and then I'm afraid that they might give in because the bear is too, right. too big uh, uh, to eat us. Um, it, it is really, this is also part of the propaganda show of, of, of the Kremlin, uh, making us fear. And, and this fear part, um, I'm not so sure how we can manage it uh, with, uh, just with enlightenment. Okay. It doesn't work. All right, Isabel, are people in Germany, are you, you're the uh, public opinion expert, are people in Germany in fear? Well, you know, as I said, there is, there is a split, you know, and it, it's, more, it's more how you perceive the future that's coming at you and the transformation and how you actually believe you can prevail on it. If you, if you believe for yourself that this being more of an opportunity than a, than, than a threat. And if you, if, you don't, if you say, well, I'm fine, is how do you think about, you know, maybe your, your children's future? And, and I think there is really an issue of political leadership being in this and kind of bringing people along and empowering them, right? I think that's, that's really what is important because on the other hand, and you, you were asking a little bit more critically about the issue of containment and is that even possible? Well, in a certain sense, and people actually do realize a lot, it is not possible because remember when the sanctions sit and all the big talk, the big game, how this would break, how this is the biggest sanction game, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Russia managed very well to kind of wiggle out of that. And I think it's also to understand that the West is not as powerful, apparently, as they were before. We've got just a minute to, to, to wrap it up. So, Stephen, I'm Yeah, there. I mean, uh, the, the weakness of the West is also intellectual, and it's up to us yeah. to respond to this. I remember, so, we're at the university, so... Exactly. It, so it, it doesn't... I mean, <laughs> you talk about fear. Everybody's fearful, and the children are fear, uh, and whatever. I mean, we are citizens. We are citizens of a free Europe. We are uh, kind of co-shares of a huge enterprise, and we have to make it a success. I mean, we got it all for free. You were talking, Ben, like uh, uh, our experience as Western Germans uh, having this wonderful party for free, freedom, democracy, do whatever you like, earn money, whatever, and now it's kind of payback time. And uh, that is exactly the way how we should address the public, that you, it's now you, and it's uh, the responsibility, it's not just on Germany as a kind of, on the German government, on the chancellor, but it's on all of us, and it's maybe tiring, yes it is, and uh, will it drag on? Yeah, it will be still quite turbulent we need to but make a we will yeah. we will do that <laughs> all and right. we will prevail and this is the kind of story that we have to convey all right when we talk about the future of uh, europe in these turbulent times uh, there's no doubt that berlin is absolutely crucial the people of germany the politicians in the bundestag nearby here have enormous power to steer the continent's future and be the major driver of the european engine let's call it this way but how will they use this power that remains to be seen. This was Capital Questions, a TVP World series. For more content from the region, follow us on tvpworld.com on our, and on our social media. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for watching and for being with us. Till next time, goodbye.